Thank you, Andrew. If my, uh, if my voice is as strong at 92 as Brother Ron's, I'll be, uh, <laughs> he's complaining about a weak voice, and I thought, wow, that's beautiful. Thank you. In fact, when we drove in here this morning, I thought, I hope Brother Ron, Ron sings. <laughs> Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a joy to be with you all, and uh, forgive me for showing up short notice. Brother Andrew and I have been talking, and we've been trying to get down here, and Sunday where we were headed got canceled, so we're here. Thank you all for letting us be here. And I want you to know, first of all, let's find John 1, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and I'm sorry, chapter 14, John 14. My printer left me a little mistake there, John 14. But we, I want you to know we're praying with you. The conference is praying with you as the Lord leads you and, and uh, the pastoral search time. I just, I just want you to know that uh, you're not alone in that, and uh, we're, we're working with you as we can and praying with you as we can. So uh, may God give you wisdom and us wisdom and put a burden on someone's heart. John 14, I thought as the, uh, Brother Andrew was uh, introducing the scriptures this morning, about the Lord's shepherd, how they fit with, with where I felt like we should go in this part of the service. The 14th chapter of John is an amazing chapter. You know it, of course, as the chapter where Jesus announces that if he goes away, he's going to uh, prepare a place for us and that uh, he's going to come back. He also reminds them that there's a place there, the, the preparation place is a place where we will have residence. King James says mansions. Other, other translations have a different word. But the point is, uh, Jesus is reminding us that he knows who we are and where we are. This chapter breaks into an incredible portion in Jesus' life. If you were to back up, uh, he, he talks to them about, well, first of all, they've had the they're involved with the Last Supper, what we know as the Passover Supper. Uh, Jesus has washed the disciples' feet. He's had his last conversation with Peter and asked him to go do what he needed to do. And then, I'm sorry, Judas, <laughs> thank you. And then, and then he, he, he really opens his heart to them, if you will, for them to understand that there's going to be a significant transition in their relationship in their lives. And that occasions, of course, the first verse of chapter 14, where he says, don't let your heart be troubled. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? Transition time or adjusting time in our lives are always times that we see as trouble times. And not necessarily trouble in the sense of a huge crisis, but just the uncertainty of transition. But the Lord reminds them to not let their heart be distraught or overburdened. And then he gives them this incredible promise. In my Father's house are many mansions or many dwelling places. And uh, I would have, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And of course, then there's conversation following that. They want to know where he's going and We'd be the same. Would how long are you going to be gone? When are you, when are you coming back? Well, he doesn't answer all of those questions, but he does. Uh, in verse fifteen, he says, "If if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and He will give you another Helper or Comforter, that He may, may abide with you forever." The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. 
And then verse 18 is our text this morning. Jesus said to them, I will not leave you comfortless, or the New King James says orphans. And I want to use that. I want to use that thought this morning. We're not orphans. You're not an orphan. And I don't, I'm not talking particularly this morning about you individually. I'm talking about you as a congregation. Family means many things to many people. <laughs> and if we were to stop and say this morning, tell us what family means, we would get a number of different answers, wouldn't we? What does it mean to be a family? But also, on the other side of that, what does it mean to be an orphan? What does it mean, if you will, to be without a comforter? To, to, to explain an orphan is fairly clear. It means a person who has, for some reason, lost their parentage, who's not included in a community of, belief, of, of family, who has lost the support and comfort that are part of all of that. The companionship. But to be family means we have all of those things under normal circumstances. You ever been in a setting where you're with a, perhaps a large group of people, but they're all family and you're the outsider? And maybe you're sitting in the living room or perhaps you're outside sitting under a large shade tree and you're participating in the conversation but it doesn't go very far or very long until things are said that you sort of are on the outside of I, I know in our family we have little and, and we never built this intentionally but we have little code words that you know out of a circumstance that happened a situation that happened years ago and, and if you're part of the family, you know exactly what that means. And everybody laughs. And the outsiders think, these people are just weird. <laughs> because, because you're not a part of the family. You have to have been involved with the circumstances to have some idea what's going on, what's being said. We, we have, our family has a strange sense of humor. We tell new people or if, that come into the family that uh, if we don't tease you, we don't love you. <laughs> At our house, if you don't get teased at all, you probably, get, you probably ought to know somebody doesn't like you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Jesus is preparing his disciples to understand that though he's going away, they're part of a community. They're part of a body. He said, uh, he's telling them, I'm going away, but I'm going to send you a comforter, or somebody to be with you. I will not leave you comfortless, or I will not leave you as someone who doesn't have family. You see, Jesus, his promise implies the beauty of community, the, the joy of gathering together, being part of a larger body. Orphans have needs. They have wants. They are often without comfort and support. But Jesus has promised to us that we will have comfort and support and strength and help. He says, I am coming to you in verse 18. What an incredible thought that is. You ever, you ever feel like you're alone in the world? Jesus has promised that he would be with us. He knows where you are. In verse 20 of this chapter, he says, I, in, I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. That's an incredible concept. God and the Father are one, but he invites us into that same community. Imagine, as believers, you and I get to participate in the interaction of the Trinity, Amen. the divine God. What a joy to know we're part of his family. The implication is that we have eternal parentage. And because of that, we have everything we need in order to live as he wants us to. In fact, he expects us 
He, he really expects us to participate as part of the family. You know, I've, I've talked to people who say, in fact, there's a fellow who attends our church some, who said to me the other day on the phone, you know, I can worship out by the lake as well as I can at church. And I'm thinking, no, you can't. You really can't. Because out by the lake, you're not part of community. You're not part of family. You've got to come to the table. You've got to sit down with us to be family. And Jesus in, in, implies, at least, or indicates to us that being part of this family includes understanding what matters to the family. What, is, what, is, what matters here? What matters to you? matters to the Father and matters to the larger group of people. Notice again, he says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. In other words, he's saying, we know you and understand you and we care about what you're wrestling with. Again, he, he includes in the thought that being far, part of the family means also that we understand what it's like to participate in family. My father was, uh, my father was uh, pretty short of patience with somebody who didn't understand what it meant to be part of the family. There was certain behavior that just uh, wasn't allowed. Do, do, you, do you understand that? Now, I had a, as a boy and for a long time in my early life, I had a really short fuse and a really quick temper. But I knew there were some places where that didn't get expressed. And it was particularly where my father was because that's not how you behaved in his presence. Am I making sense? Being part of this family indicates to us that he, he cares about us and in that caring about us, he wants us to know some things. First of all, he wants us to know that he wants to comfort us. He wants us to not, if you will, not to feel alone. Because we're not alone. I've had people say to me, well, well I, don't, I don't feel God every day. Well, you don't have to feel him. He's made you a promise. And by faith, you respond to that promise. Now, please understand me. What we feel as believers is important, but it's not the foundation for our walk. Our walk is by faith, and he's made us a promise that he will be with us. He's also reminded us that he, the spirit of truth, will be with us. So he educates us. He teaches us what we need to know in order to walk. I thought about Brother Ron's confession this morning. Thank you, Brother, for a tender heart. I'm serious about that. We had just finished up our prayer time, and we were sort of rejoicing, and one of us said, God's good, and somebody else said all the time, and Brother Ron, he already testified what he said. And I, and I thought, as he said that, I thought, well, I'm not going to approach that subject right now, but he's even good when he disciplines us because he's doing it for our good. But I thought about that's what the Lord was doing, was, was teaching. And I'm thankful for a fellow at his age who's willing to listen to that teaching. I had a fellow, in, when we were pastoring in Canada, I had a man who got saved and out of a dark world. And uh, God was working in his life. And he and I were meeting every Wednesday at noon to pray. And he came in one Wednesday and his face was just black, just dark. His complexion, you know. And I said to him, man, what's the matter? And he said, I'm in trouble. And I said, what? And he said, well, you know, I've talked to you about... Before I got saved, I used to go with some guys and we'd watch wrestling every Tuesday night. I said, yeah, you've talked about that. And he said, well, I'd made up my mind. The Lord's been talk, convicting me about that and I made up my mind I wasn't going to go again. But my buddies started calling me Monday night, four or five guys, and they just called one after another. And last night I went and watched wrestling with them. And he said, I've been in trouble with the Lord ever since. And I looked at him and said, you ought to be thanking God. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, my Bible tells me that if I'm a son, I get disciplined. <laughs> Thank God you're a son and take the discipline. And it's suddenly his face changes. He says, 
Oh, wow, that's good. I can guarantee you he's never watched wrestling again. <laughs> because God worked in it. That's part of family. He teaches us. He leads us. He, he does more than just teach us educationally, but he teaches us in behavior and attitude and expectation. Being part of family under, means to understand some of that. There are some things that you just don't talk about. Does that make sense? It's interesting to watch my boys. We have three boys and a, and a daughter, and particularly the boys. There are, there are certain things they don't talk about when mother's around. <laughs> they just know that, that if, she, if, they're, if, if they're there and she's there, she's going to reprimand them. That's, that's part of and, and it's kind of funny because occasionally they do it just because they know how she's going to respond. <laughs> but it's part of being family. It indicates that I'm willing to walk in obedience with the family. Verses 21 through 24 of this chapter, he, he talks about, he talks about, in verse 21, talks about the rich expression of balance. Let's, let's locate it, if you will. 21, he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. What an incredible promise. If I love him, I'll obey him. And if I obey him, if I walk in love and obedience with him, he shows himself to me. The richness of that balance. And to know that the structure of being part of this family is to respond to the truth of his word and walk in obedience to that. I don't know if you've ever read or heard of the story of Dave. Uh, actually, there are three books, A Boy Without a Name, The Lost Child, and the, the final book is, is the, A Man Called Dave, one of the most heart-wrenching stories I've ever read. Dave was born into what appeared to be a normal family, but for some reason, his mother rejected him. The other children, she handled as normal children, but there was something about Dave that was different. He never got to eat at the table. He never got to sleep in a normal bed. Uh, she badly misused him. Uh, she'd make him sit at the bottom of the steps in the basement to eat when the other children in the family were eating at the table. A graphic, dark picture. And then finally, finally somebody at school realized that something was happening. In fact, what she was doing to punish him, she'd put his hands in acid and was eating the skin off the backs of his hands and the school system finally took him away and put him in a foster system and, and uh, that wasn't all that much better. The lost child is the story of the years in, in uh, the foster system. But then as a young adult he found Christ and his life changed and the, the, the book of a man called Dave is the story of that transformation and how God changed his life and gave him a family and how he tried to reconnect with his birth family. But I thought as I read through that, that's how so many people in our world are living. They're living like they don't have a name or they're living like they're lost because they are, because they don't, they don't know God and they don't know the community of faith and they don't know what it means to be part of a, a group of people who love them and care. Jesus announced to us in this, in this passage the privileges of being part of a family. And the first one is that he loves us. Aren't you thankful for that? The great love of God, to know somebody loves you, has incredible value. To know that we're loved in the community, the worship, the place, the church where we worship, has value. It's kind of interesting, the church that we're pastoring when I'm not doing anything else since I don't have enough to do. Uh, for a long time, we ran 12. That was a good Sunday. And then about a year and a half ago, God started bringing people to us. And Easter Sunday, I think there were 44 people there. And they're all not us. Does that make sense? But they all say, 
oh, we don't want to miss because there's love here. People care about us. And I thought, God, help us to, to sustain that, to show in a balanced and beautiful way the love of Christ to a broken people. He promised us one of the privileges of family is love. I will love them, Jesus said, and reveal myself to them. It includes a place that's called home, a place where I belong. We all need to know we belong somewhere. Listen to me. When the enemy tries to tell you you don't belong, I want to remind you, Jesus says something else. And that is you do belong. You're not an orphan. You're not alone. You're part of family. He brings to you the comfort. I will come to them and make, we will make our home with them. Just think of that. Yes. To think God promised to come to us and dwell with us. One translation says it this way, that he pitched his tent beside our tent. In other words, he lives with us. He lives where we are. He knows where you are. You're not alone. I want to remind you as a congregation this morning that as you search a pastor, you're not alone. God knows where you are. There are others who are praying with you and working with you. You're not alone. He also promises the joy of peace. What a privilege that is. Have you ever been in a place where there isn't peace? Where you got to be really careful what you say or somebody's going to explode? Well, the beauty is as a believer... We can find a place where we don't have to worry about that. He's promised his peace to us. My peace, I give them. And then he promises the privilege of po the power of family. The authority, if you will, of family. My dad mechaniced. And uh, often, particularly in my junior high and high school years, often I'd come in from school and Dad would say, Claire, I need you to run to town and get parts. And I would, uh, I would go to the parts house and buy, no, I didn't buy. I signed a piece of paper for thousands and thousands of dollars of automotive parts. I never had to pay for them unless they went on my car because I was doing it in Dad's name. He took care of the business. But I had the authority as a child to participate well, the joy is God gives us that same, if you will, that same power of being part of the family. My identity now is not who I was. My identity is who I am in Christ. The authority I have is not my authority. It's his authority that he's promised to us. The privilege is that through prayer and interaction with him, we, we have this incredible joy of being part of his family and identifying with him. Part of the being family is the confidence that we have, to, that we have wisdom and support and love, the comfort of traditions. When I was in Bible college, there was a young fellow who, who was in the dorm room with me who had grown up as an orphan. He, his entire life, he'd, he'd never been family anywhere. He lived in the orphanage for several years and then he spent a little bit of time in Duncan, Oklahoma with a family as he went to high school. And then he shows up at BMI. And he and I became close friends. But it was interesting to watch him try to interact and understand what life was like because he'd never had the opportunity of being in a family where he had the, the, the ability to make his own decisions and live with the confidence of being part of a family who loved him regardless of what he did. One of the things that stands out in my mind is often we'd go to town to do a little bit of shopping and if he was looking for a pair of trousers or a pair of shoes, he had the hardest time making a decision. He'd, he'd find a pair of trousers he'd like and then he'd say, well, should I buy black or should I buy brown or should I buy gray? And I'd say, well, Ralph, buy what you want. Buy the ones you like. But he'd never had that. He'd never been taught as a child to make those kind of decisions. So he's constantly wrestling with the, with the business of interacting with people at a level, and himself at a level that would allow those kind of things to happen normally. And I thought about, 
in regard to that, I thought about people I've met in the church who, though they may have been professing to be Christians for years, they've never found a place where they can rest in the Father's promise. He's promised you you're part of the family. The comfort of that, the rest of that, the peace that's part of that is a joy to know that God loves us. And as a congregation, he knows where you are. He knows you, and he loves you, and he's not forgotten you. The enemy's going to try to tell you that he has, and that it doesn't matter. I want to tell you again this morning that you're, you're part of the family. Not just the Bible Methodist family, and thank God you're part of that, but you're part of the family of God in the larger community. You see, the promise that he's given to us, that he's, he will not leave us. Thank you. Thank the Lord for that. I had a young fellow, one place I was pastoring, he came to me one day and he said, you know, God's going to just leave us alone one of these days. And I said to him, is that correct? And he said, yes. And I said, is it in your Bible? And he said, yes. And I said, I'd really like to see that. And he said, okay, I'll bring it. Give me, a, give me a Sunday or two, I'll bring it. Well, I gave him three Sundays. And after the third Sunday morning service, I stopped him and called him by name. And I said, that, that scripture you told me you were going to bring to me. I said, I didn't think you were interested. I said, no, I don't think you can find it. Because my Bible tells me exactly the opposite. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What a God we serve. He cares about you. He knows about you and you're part of the family.